Hello and welcome to a new Genshin Impact Theory video. In this video we will talk about the lore of flowers, Nabu Malikata and what we've learned about her and about the chronology of the events from ancient Sumeru. Despite the new version 3.4 quest being mainly centered on Lilupar's story, I won't really cover the events that brought to the destruction of the city of Gurabad, but I could make a separate video specifically on that in the future if you're interested. If you're asking yourselves who the person in my thumbnail is, let's say that I had a sudden urge to draw what a lot of flowers may have looked like according to me. So yeah, that's my idea of her. It took me a few hours, so it's not the best illustration you'll ever see in your life, but it still does its job. As always, this is a theory video. I use information available in the game and my own research to get my own conclusions, so my deductions are not the official lore of the game. Now, let's start the video with something really interesting. In the orchard of Paridesa, the three thrones were sculpted in honor of the three friends that were supposed to meet again and be together for all eternity. This at least was King Dashred's wish anyway. On those thrones, we found inscriptions of the names of these three friends. One is DSHRT, so the Shred, and I have a feeling something's up with the fact that this is the only seed on which the flowers bloomed. Are we being told that maybe the Shred is not actually completely dead or that we are going to meet him somehow? Anyway, the other seed is Nabu MLKTA, so Nabu Malikata, the Lord of Flowers. And the last one is RUKDVTA, so Rukadevata. Wait a second, why does the seed say Rukadevata and not Kusanali? All memories of Rukadevata were supposed to be erased from Tevat, both from people's mind and from any physical object that talked about her, like books. And she was substituted by Kusanali, so why is her name still here? Well, I have an idea about it. Lilopar told Jet that the Orchard of Paradesa is the mistress of Flower's final sphere of influence, that the offerings of the skies protected serenity here deep beneath the earth, and that this place preserves the last of her essence. This makes me think that, once again, we are inside someone's consciousness, basically a domain born from a consciousness, just like Makoto's plane. There, Makoto told us that we were free from the clutches of the heavenly principles, so Estra's power was able to work above the laws of Tevat. Since the Orchard of Paradesa is frozen in time, I wouldn't be surprised if Estros was behind this place as well. If I'm right about this, then the fact that Ermansol didn't change Rukadevata's name is because here as well we are free from the heavenly principles, so we are in a place that functions above the laws of Tevat. This is the only conclusion I can come up with, to be honest. We also need to add the fact that the Eternal Oasis was built on a celestial nail, the one that created the desert in the first place back when the Envoy Age was ending. Just like on Tsurumi Island, we don't see the actual nail, but we see the spot where it landed, which in this case is in the middle of the sand tornado on Mount Damaband. But there's also one more odd thing in the Orchard of Paradesa. Behind the tree, in the middle of the lake, there's an Ermansol tree. Now, of course, there's a major Leyland disruption here since the garden runs on the power of a celestial nail, and we've seen multiple times how the nails cause Leyland disorders, and in Sumeru's case, the disruption is the whole desert. But the odd thing is that, despite the garden being connected to the ley lines, Rukadevata's name didn't change. Talking about oddities, here's another one. The Orchard of Paradesa is the place of the Lord of Flowers unintentionally created as she was cast away from the heavens, and where she remained when begged by the genie. The garden where maddened monks and lost wanderers felt at peace because this was probably Nabu Malikata's innate power. This oasis was created from her wounds as she walked for 72 days in the desert after being cast aside from the heavens. The same desert that was created by a celestial nail at the end of the Envoy Age, which is also the last age in which there were three moons in the sky, and the evidence we've found so far gives us a 99% chance that the Lord of Flowers was one of the three moon sisters. So I wonder, does the crystalline sapphire nail have a deeper connection to the Lord of Flowers? I mean, she was sent on Tevat approximately at the same time as the celestial nails descended, but the desert was already there when she arrived. She then created an oasis right where the nail hit the ground and she decided to remain there. It feels very odd to be honest and there's clearly something more behind this. Then we have King the Shred somehow meeting and befriending Nabu Malikata, although she never left the garden. 
They built Aihanum and ruled over the desert together, but when she died, King Deshret searched in vain for the ancient paradise where the Divine Needle fell, and there created an eternal oasis, which, as it is, doesn't really make sense, because we then learn that Deshret used the Nail's power to create the eternal oasis to preserve the last essence of Nabun Alikata, so his search wasn't in vain, he did find the Nail in the end. Even Lilupar said that the offerings of the skies protect the serenity of the oasis. But then, if he had to search for this ancient paradise, how did he even meet Nabu Malikata since the genie begged her never to leave the same ancient paradise? This means that there is still a specific passage of history that we are missing, which is basically Nabu Malikata leaving the orchard of Paradesa for some reason and meeting the Shred. Maybe the flowers on the Shred seat bloomed to give us a hint about what we're going to learn in a future update, which is the rest of the story, probably from the Shred's point of view. We are also missing Ruka Devata's meeting with the two since she suddenly appears in the story. Moving on, let's talk about the Lord of Flowers' name, Nabu Malikata. Nabu was an ancient Mesopotamian patron god of literacy, rational arts, scribes and wisdom, and the Hebrew word Navi, on which his name may come from, also means prophet. Now, what Ahatham said in his video makes even more sense once we learn that the god Nabu was also the inventor of writing. That's maybe why uncovering the origins of languages may be forbidden, considering the Lord of Flowers was cursed by the heavens and led a rebellion against the heavenly principles. Nabu, the Mesopotamian god, was also a god of vegetation, which makes sense in Genshin Impact since she is indeed the Lord of Flowers. He also wore a horn cap, just like the Lord of Flowers he used to have horns. As the god of writing, Nabu inscribed the fates of men, while as an oracle he was associated with the Mesopotamian moon god Sin, a god associated with cattle because of his bull horns and the crescent moon. This is basically what we've already talked about in my video about Ashikai's theories, and it also brings back her theory about the three moons being something like the Moirai, the three fates, which is also heavily implied in the description of the weapon Xifo's Moonlight, when the genie says the three departed goddesses had long determined the hero's fates. When it comes to Malikata, I was able to find two options. It may come from the Queen of Sheba, who in Arabic was called Malikat Saba, while in Hebrew is Malkat Saba. She is a figure that appears in the Hebrew Bible and she brought a caravan of valuable gifts, mainly spices, to King Solomon because she wanted him to answer her hard questions. His answers were satisfactory and she left to return to her land. I think this is a viable option because Lilupar told the traveler that he has the scent of unknown spices from afar. The other option is the title given to a she-demon from the apocryphal work known as the Arabic Testament of Solomon, so still connected to him. This demon, Taudura or Al-Ardamis, was given the title of Malikat al-Jin, the Queen of Demons, and the word Malika or Malikat, which in Arabic simply means queen, can also be used to refer to a goddess, in this case a goddess of demons or evil spirits. Then there's the Al-Jin part of the name that finds a direct connection to Genshin Impact since the Lord of Flowers generated the genie. To this, let's add that one of her names, Al Artemis, is a transliteration of the name of the Greek goddess Artemis, also known as Diana, the goddess of hunting and nature but also of the moon. This was also the name that we found in its plural form as Dianas on the murals on Tsurumi Island, which refers to the three moons in the sky. Regardless of which of these options is right, if not both of them together, Malikata is always connected to Solomon and he is probably one of the mythological characters that were used to create King the Shred, along with, in my theory, Samael and or Asmodeus, since these two names are sometimes interchangeable and are extremely connected to Solomon. Now what troubles me about the Lord of Flowers is the creation of the genie, more specifically who they actually may be. We've seen in the Flower of Paradise Lost that the Lord of Flowers was seemingly oblivious to love and human emotions. The Plume of Death says the Lord of Flowers never knew a love that could be as sweet as wine, let alone the paltriness of human emotion. So how is it possible that the spirits that were born from her body were capable of such an intense love? I mean, Lilo Parfait completely in love with Ormas, she even betrayed the pact she made with King the Shred and gave Ormas their true name, which means giving all of herself to him. 
Once she realized that her love and trust had been betrayed because of the intensity of the love Ginny feels, betrayal is also as intense, so she brought down three entire generation and a whole city. My theory, albeit based on pretty much nothing but a possible logical deduction, so take it with a grain of salt, is that the genie were the byproduct of the curse that was laid on the Lord of Flowers. We've witnessed that a heavenly curse takes away from the people their soul and their humanity, and turns them into brainless monsters, basically. We also know of the tale of the Sealy, who should have never fallen in love with a human, but it did, and the entire civilization was cursed because of it. We also know from the Flower of Life or the Flower of Paradise Lost Artifact set that the Jinn were birthed from intoxicating dreams and the bitter memories of loss. What if the genie were the manifestation of what was removed from the Lord of Flowers because of the curse? That would explain why she was a savage husk, although she still retained her humanly shaped body, and it would also explain why she wasn't capable of understanding love, why the genie felt it maybe a little bit too hard. When the Traveler sees the Lord of Flowers, and for that thank you Mihoyo for not showing us by the way, he saw that she was the totality of her genie, as if they were just petals of a complete flower. He also met her gaze and he found nothingness, an endless void. She was stripped of her emotions, of what made her a living being, hence she was left a savage husk. Something else we learned through this quest, thanks to Lilupar, is the chronology of the events. We now know that the Shred and Nabu Malikata's rebellion against the heavens began when the three gods were still living together, and it was the reason why Ruka Devata decided to leave and create her own forest nation in a different part of the desert. The rebellion began while the Arkham War in other nations had already begun, since the Shred rejected the gift granted by the Divine Throne, so he wasn't interested in becoming an Arkham. After the Lord of Flowers sacrifice, the Shred told the genie that she was sleeping in the Eternal Oasis and she would eventually come back, so knowing how much the Lord of Flowers trusted the Shred, the genie gave him their true names and accepted to be sealed into bottles. Now, differently from what Lilupar says, the Shred didn't really lie to them. It's more like he deceived himself, convincing himself that he would be able to use the forbidden knowledge to bring her back, so in a sense, he didn't lie to the genie, he lied to himself. Probably only Fergie's, the greatest genie who stood guard at the entrance of the Eternal Oasis, knew the truth about the Lord of Flowers and what the Shred was trying to do, since she has long been waiting, always waiting, in a sleepless dream, waiting for the King of Sand to fulfill his ancient promise. And she also told Lilupar that the Oasis was an empty tomb and that there is nothing there but the coalescence of regret. And that's it, I really hope you liked the video. I think I will talk about the Lantern Ride in my next video and it's probably gonna be an even shorter video. I already wrote the script actually because this video was supposed to cover both topics but then I realized that I had quite a lot to say about Nabu Malikata. Anyway, as always, if you liked the video, don't forget to leave a thumbs up and if you enjoy Genshin Impact Theory videos, consider subscribing. I see you in the comment section in case you have doubts or theories and in the meantime, over and out.